evening, ladies and gentlemen. My role is perfunctory. I've been advised to say that there will be five sections to this uh, program this evening, and they'll each uh, be started with a brief musical episode, and that at 8.10 precisely, the evening will end, and that there will be no questions, but next Monday night, there will be discussion. Houses are usually the wrong size and very often the wrong shape. This would appear to have been so for a very long time. People have knocked the front parlour into the scullery and caught it in the back seat of cars and had breakfast by the bread oven. Uh, they pulled down the east wing and built ballrooms. They've stuck greenhouses on the back of the house, porches on the front, and rooms in the, in the roof. These are the people who have houses. It hasn't uh, been limited to the very rich. It certainly hasn't been an opportunity for the very poor. But that's not quite true either, because they made homes for several families in one house or in one room or in present day situations a cardboard box. It would appear that the house though it is never the right size or the right shape increasingly is not in the right place and yet it's a product probably more than any other architectural product that has a uh, been adopted for all the other forms that architects uh, usually like to feel are specialized, that require particular attention. And it is a noticeable fact of architecture today that to a large extent housing and houses are ignored. Or if not ignored, they're used as some counters counters in some money game, in some power game, or in some social patterning tag game. This is even evident when they are illustrated in architectural magazines. There are very few architectural magazines which now produce scale plans of houses being built. Oh yes, you'll get a colored axonometric from roof height or higher. You'll get the elevation shown with shadows and purple keystones. You try and find the scale. Try and find the, the space. And indeed, try to find the space is one of the shortcomings of most housing design. It isn't that they're not clever. It isn't that they're not uh, ingenious. It's usually that they are too small volumetrically. Again, this is not always... <coughs> found to be a particularly new situation because long before the Industrial Revolution, houses, if they were by a stream and uh, a flock of sheep or a port, uh, would produce their workshops on the top floor. Not for them the big windows to the living rooms or the bedrooms, but certainly the big window for the workshop floor on the top, in the roof, catching the light so that the wool or the cotton could be spun and in many cases woven. You now get this other situation of uh, those, those people who have wires and, or at least non-wired battery contained objects speaking to each other over enormous distances throughout the day. Uh, businessmen, I suppose. You, you get the slogan, um, they could just as well work at home. I'm so wired up, I'm in touch with Tokyo, Wall Street, Bank of England. Easy, I work at home. You get odd artisans, creative people, who've always written at home, not just the Austins. Uh, so the nature of housing 
is something which is not defined, or at least if it is defined, it probably gets it wrong. And it gets it wrong in size, space, and possibly location. And yet I suggest that it is one of the major products of architectural effort, one of the major elements that we should be concerned with. And yet we have largely opted out. And the architectural profession, to its shame, many years ago, and these talks are primarily based in the United Kingdom, because that's what I know best. Many years ago, there was very little objection when the last remaining statutory requirements for minimum sizes in houses, <coughs> part of them were statutory, laid down by the Parker Morris proposals, were just uh, rescinded, wiped out. I'm afraid, uh, not by its present government, but by the government before. But governments haven't shown themselves uh, very concerned about housing, except where it was a vote catcher, and then usually in relation to numbers. So, in memory of Peter Cook, who couldn't come here tonight, because this was primarily meant to bore him, I shall read you a list. <clears throat> now, these are just propositions. Housing, an assumed continuous societal need, an assumed variable societal appetite, a convenience and or necessity, a constituent of social servicing, a desirable expensive extra, an aberration to subsidizing people, an alternative to subsidizing people, a market-controlled consumer product. <laughs> Many people are finding how expensive the market can be if in fact they put their money into a house. A natural resource of a developed country, a method of population control. Now houses Quantifiable item related to particular demand. These are question marks. A national asset determinable through population and affluence counts. An artificial uh, conglomerate signifying a social grouping. A series of commodities, a prerequisite of a static society. That again is something that is hoped for by some persons at the moment. A collection of land-anchored products, a constituent of a balanced community, an incentive for continuity of labor resources. Never mind on your bike, stay where the house is. Of course, another thing that happens with housing, thinking of the workshops and the factories and the offices, is of course the school, particularly for those who take a degree, say, in the open university at the age of 45 and no classrooms available for them. Now a house, what is it? 24 hour living toy, a communally desired possession, a container for continuous or intermittent human activity, an attractive form of public and or private investment, an heirloom, a guarantee of respectability, a store for personal belongings, a living museum in a way, that uh, too often becomes um, a sort of well-furnished coffin before its time. <laughs> a readily available mobile private amenity, a static distorter of a 24-hour cycle. Come on, we must go to bed now, quiet. Neighbors will hear us if we go upstairs. <laughs> or is it a part of a home? Well, let's take the home, final part of the boring list. A non-locational self-choice, if over 18 years old, collective living condition. A convenient socio-administrative unit. A displacement tendency. A person-to-person -person multi-purpose exchange condition. A collection of houses and other useful containers. A statutory unit, this is the home. An assumed consumer of houses, 
a privately financed hospital and restaurant for friends. <laughs> Now, the, the uh, universal container is interesting because if people are given the choice, and very often choice in relation to houses or homes is, relation, is related to um, available, disposable cash. And so it's not that uh, those who have that commodity necessarily own lots of houses. But you'll find them and theirs using hotels, using yachts, having holidays in tents, uh, playing it rough in some converted water mill or windmill, granary or wine store in some unbearable bit of South Europe and calling it a holiday. <laughs> well, it, um, <laughs> questions next week, Mr. Chairman, if you don't mind. Bernard Shaw once defined the modern house as somewhere to sleep next to the motor car. <laughs> uh, it's worth bearing in mind that some of the very good plans, both of J.J.P. Oud, and indeed in that book, 1944, by Walter Siegel, before he started building his houses, apart from the wooden house, which bears attention that he built for his mother by Lake Geneva in the 30s, um, both these architects did in fact explore the surface of the house as additional uh, living space. Um, not just the flat roof, but the sheltered drive, uh, the patio, the half roof, the balcony, the horizontal plane, as opposed to the pitched roof, which was largely used for storage. And coming on to storage, it was very often in the early houses that were really the necessity for the industry of the area and of the day that the people became the etc., and that the house primarily housed the cattle. So you lived not alongside the car, a la Bernard Shaw, but alongside the cattle, which were your livelihood, which were your equipment for living. And uh, it might have been cattle or it might have been the storage for food, but the use of the whole cycle, 24-hour, 24, uh, 24 12-month-a-year cycle of industry related to agriculture would often see the actual house unit, i.e. the people container bit, a very small and minor part of a single structure. And if you were to work out how many hours those people with microphones in their pockets, trousers, everywhere else, um, spend in these uh, office blocks being put up, you'd find that primarily uh, there is more uh, part of the elements that I've raised in house and home and living taking place in office buildings than there is in the little mortgaged uh, house in uh, Reading or where Spitterfields, <laughs> these smart zoom areas. The acceptance or the awareness of what I said has no generative power in what the house that you design tomorrow should have, in so much as they are primarily uh, end products of either pressures that have been existing for hundreds of years or shortages that have been satisfied in some way by means of containment, by means of shelter, call it a house, call it a workspace, of the comparatively recent past. 
the uh, get on your bike mentality for getting a job ignores the static nature of housing that is built. But the other static nature is the dependency that people who have nothing but a cardboard box require of other bits of architecture in order to live, which then becomes a housing estate, whether it's the South Bank or, or uh, underneath the arches or whatever. So is there, in fact, a network? Is there, in fact, a series of conditions that housing demands in order to provide eventual accommodation that is quite irrespective of the number of bedrooms or your own front door. And indeed, when you take things like the number of bedrooms and the dining room and the kitchen and the front door, who leads that life now? Now, we know that photographs by the admirable body, shelter, of people desperate in, the, in their uh, hotel rooms, which they have to get out of at 8.30 in the morning, the council paid rooms for the homeless, there is always, amongst the squalor, the overcrowding, the sad children and the even sadder parents, but then that's a question they have to solve. Is, Good Lord, what's crept in? <laughs> Every time I meet children, I hear something like a cat. Um, every time in those photographs, or almost every time, there's a television set in the corner. Now, I'm not one, as many people used to say, uh, after the end of the war, when uh, council houses had bathrooms, they said, oh, they shouldn't have bathrooms, they'll only keep coal in it. And certainly, I can remember when these photographs came out of abject poverty, that people would say, well, they can't be that poor, there's a television set. Can't be that hungry, there's a television set. And yet, who actually ever looks, as I am looking, at the kitchen clock nowadays? They look at the Radio Times, or they, they look at CFAX, or whatever. The, the hours, the interval, the 24-hour living toy, is played by influences which are quite outside the nature of the window, the height of the draining board, the chopping block, all the things, the chopping block, the spice bottles, the strings of garlic, the thing. They're, they're Christmas presents from people who don't know what to give them. And they fill up the room called kitchen. But they, they eat either their takeaway or their microwave uh, dinner as and when the program on television demands. <laughs> Not, ah, oh, let's sit down to Sunday lunch. Or now, better do your homework before dinner. It's a dream world. And yet, architects, bedroom one, bedroom two, bedroom three, staircase, living room, kitchen, larder, hall, doesn't work like that. Telephones, television sets, radios, God knows what, every room of the house. Very unfortunate, in fact, those three bedrooms. Difficult to knock rooms through one to another now because of the construction. Always needed. Sir John Stone, he wasn't satisfied with one miserable terrace house. He knocked two together. Um, the nature of, of what is offered is unlikely to match the aspirations of those it's offered to, whether it's public housing, a hotel room, or whatever. Purpose-built, uh, converted, doesn't matter. So, in fact, architecturally, you're, you're, in a way, the slate is clean as to what you provide. Gives me time to do the next notes. Mm. 
national plan, or for me to talk about a national plan, uh, is a little rum in itself. For those of you who, who remember that I, together with Bannum, Paul Barker, and Peter Hall, were joint authors of non-plan, which was a plea for the abolition of almost all planning control. And therefore, I better describe, first of all, what I mean by a national plan. It is a plan, really, of potential, not resources, but potential processes of what we find on the plate at the moment. And on our plate is an island which, <coughs> for the area, compared with any other island in the world, if I am to be corrected, that's next week's game, has by far the longest coastline. It really is the opposite of the circle. Now, it was once talked of by Nye Bevan. Its asset was talked of of a nation built, sitting on coal, surrounded by fish. Neither of those commodities are rated all that important at the moment. <laughs> I'm suggesting the coastline is. Now, again, tribute to Peter Cook. <laughs> I'm very pleased to see Hazel. <laughs> In the, in the 30s, there were three very interesting plans, national plans, brought out to this country, 1937. There was the Barlow Report, Scott Report, and the Beveridge Report. And I'll just read you the titles of the plans, 1937, just to the maps in the reports. Types of farming, land of good quality, hills and valleys, woods and poor farming land, extractive industries, employment in mine, factory, office and shop, country towns selected for development, farm workers, low paid employment, 1931, overcrowding, 33 to 36, rainfall and two significant isotherms, water catchment areas, the electricity grid, gas supplies, village halls, trade and transport. The cost of living, 37 to 38. Low paid employment, 31. Three periods of employment. Hazardous industry. Women in industry. The old and the young. The old and the young, 1911, 1921. The prevention and treatment of sickness. TB, whole map, 1937 to 1938. Tuberculosis, by the way. <laughs> Doctors, secondary school. And then we went to war, and then the <coughs> 1940 Council brought out their plan. These are their headings. Notice the, the effect of the wine and food socialist writers in the meantime, between 1937 and 1940. These are, the, these are plans, not the same plans. These are the titles of the plans. Upland Hill and Vale. <laughs> Climates and the coming of spring. <laughs> Seek the sun, shun the fog. Rural solitudes and urban sprawl. Trees and trusts. Save the best farmland. Speed the plow and milk the cow. <laughs> Foundations of industry, coal, iron, salt. Pivots of industry, power and transport. Wheels of industry. Population movement, the uncontrolled shift. Raw materials of cities. The, and that is extremely uh, location of building materials, I know that. The subtitles aren't so impressive. <laughs> the mosaic of local authorities and chief built-up areas. The 
is no national legislation anywhere in the world that stops us picking up satellite broadcasts of any sort. At the moment, well, there may be equipment limitations, cost of equipment. There's no legislation. At the moment, they're worrying about us being flooded by amateur adult Italian porn. <laughs> you wait till we're flooded by educational programs. You wait till we're flooded by holiday agencies pointing the way south. Channel Tunnel is only one sign of a general draining of Western Europe to the southeast, down to the Mediterranean. Industry, population, leisure, change of jobs, young age groups. And it, this country will drain as much as anything any other country will, and is doing. It isn't just retirement homes in Spain. It's large schools of architecture in Italy as well. However, of course, greenhouse effect, people like me sweating like a pig this last year. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not planning to drain southeast. Find me back up in Cumbria or North. But generally speaking, tragic little efforts of individual countries to stop the flow, sometimes climatic and indeed sometimes political. This have the East Germany. The largest export port in this country is London Heathrow. Not Liverpool, not Tilbury, not Hull, not Southampton, not any of those lovely coastal ports that I was talking about. Latest development plan for Hampshire, speckled with floating fiberglass gin palaces in every marina has just said, we're deciding, no more marinas for us. Now, that isn't a decision of the economic or the treasurer's department of County Hall, Hampshire, by any means. The, the nature of that sort of planning is what non-plan was against. The nature of national planning is an awareness that any one time the resources of a country are very dependent and increasingly so on the comparative resources of the next country. I'm sure one could do a sort of Parkinson rule on that. And it's interesting to see in a talk I gave at a similar time of the year some years ago, it's called Summertime Breeze, which was a bit late, uh, where in fact we talked and, and investigated the Pacific only by the nature of the edge of the lake, some of whom happened to speak Vietnamese, and some spoke broad Los Angeles, but it was the edge of the lake, with the lake being the Pacific. When we investigate this country in the office, we draw it, <coughs> as we do so much in our office, lying on its back. Um, the, the north is to, to the <coughs> right-hand side of the page. And it's very interesting in arguments made for and against the uh, Channel Tunnel, when in fact some people said, well, it's all right as long as you can go straight from the Channel, channel Tunnel up to Liverpool. Because once 1992 starts, there are the common markets throughout Europe. That's when America was established there uh, identity, their legal identity in the various countries uh, like Fords of England or Singer that was or Lennox will really flood 
West Europe with their products via Liverpool and those high-speed links right down to Ashford and through the tunnel. <coughs> Having got as far as Liverpool, you might just as well go around the top of Scotland and land at Rotterdam, Europort, or up the south coast. It really doesn't matter. So all the business about um, catching, catching the trade through, through building the Channel Tunnel would seem a bit dark. But to actually drain this country, which may be a good thing, it would seem ideal. Um, when, uh, after the uh, slave trade had been sort of, it had been started by us, North America, and then the Quakers, as they often do, had a good idea and stopped it. And by that time, there were more exports of American foodstuffs and raw materials than there were imports from this country, even then. And we used to uh, ballast our boats going over to America with granite from Aberdeen, which you can find up various rivers on the east coast of America, uh, ditched when they loaded up cotton and the rest, tobacco, brought it back. Um, so, there is some possibility that uh, the trains coming back into England could bring back useful lumps of stuff <laughs> so that they don't wobble too much on the tracks. Bearing in mind that the largest single customer for freight, bulk freight, for British Rail, is not our exports, is not the National Coal Board, it's British Rail itself. And what is it moving? Broken up granite chippings. That is the largest single, largest single load by ton of its whole freight industry. Moving granite chippings to put on its own railway lines. <laughs> and just as an interesting aside, there is a large, on the Carlisle to Settle Line, that some people who've never even been to Carlisle or Settle in their lives, but decided that it was a place of extraordinary beauty, wanted saved. Uh, no one ever looked out of the windows on that line, well, you couldn't, um, <laughs> There is an enormous quarry of granite chippings on that line, with a railway line to it. That was one reason it was kept open. But the quarry is so big that it's just breaking over the skyline. So if they go on blowing out rock there, it'll have a jagged skyline. It'll be the other side, the edge of the quarry. The National Trust and the rest have said, uh uh, you must stop quarrying your granite chippings there. Find somewhere else. And the self same people who are stopping that quarry are saying, you must keep open the railway. Uh, for its scenic beauty, but it only pays by moving granite chippings. So, back to the coastlines. There are lots of harbours which did very good trade with very small boats, and the railways always put spurs out to these so they could pick up the fish, they could pick up uh, the iron ore, they could pick up a whole range of, of coastal mined and coastal quarried and coastal extracted from the sea goods. So there is an enormous network to rather derelict ports all the way around this coast. But the central networks are primarily bringing in bits of motor cars from Italy, from Spain, from Germany, into large factories outside desperate cities that are rapidly depopulating to put them together and stamp made in Britain <coughs> on the side of the car and then export it off somewhere else. So there is apparently an imbalance in movement in this country. The question of movement, whether it's along the coast, whether it feeds to the coast, or whether it's spinal, or indeed radial from London, or radial from the Channel Tunnel, which I, I, think, I think one marvelous thing about the indecision that we've learnt to expect and love from this present government about not making their mind up for another year as to just what happens when you come out of that bloody tunnel on this side 
Um, funny enough, may be a blessing in disguise. It may be just the sort of gap we need to find that once you come out of the tunnel, you don't need a direct line to anywhere. You need to spread almost immediately. It's quite interesting that even well-heeled uh, developers like Mr. Lupton or Lipton, Canary Wharf, and now getting a bit windy about getting rid of all that stuff. Uh, or Olympia New York, it isn't him, is it? The Canadians, who up till now no one put a foot wrong, but of course that was in Canada. Um, <laughs> difficult to notice if you do put a foot wrong there, I should say. <laughs> they are at the moment courting the DOE, courting the Department of Environment. Why don't you leave Marsham Street? and come to the Canary Wharf, because then we can at least uh, justify our railway link for our poor workers who are already committed to work there, because after all, it's a railway line of, of central importance. It has all those civil servants always having to get to, time, to work on time, or at least to sign in on time before they go out for tea, <laughs> a la GLC. Now, the... Uh, nature of that then is that on one hand satellite television and the rest makes a nonsense of boundaries the nature of centralization of movement within such boundaries is probably out of date the edge the penumbra between one boundary particularly ours because it's wet Half of it is underwater, half the day. I mean, that's the nice thing, rather like the civic center of Los Angeles being half underwater, half the day, because it's the beach. Um, <laughs> that the penumbra between an island with an enormous coastline and, and a rather more varied, attractive <coughs> continent is probably the other side of the balance that you set against uh, non-legislative, completely uncontrollable thoughts on uh, uh, transmission, on transport, on changing jobs, on changing attitudes, on changing friends, and on changing lifestyles, which will be spread broadcast whether the channel is 100 miles wide or 22 miles wide. doesn't matter a bit. So, in fact, we may be on an extraordinarily attractive um, uh, travel agency of an island, where, where, in fact, architects, I would suggest, in relation to planning natural and national processes, not reserves, but processes of movement and change, would start designing things that weren't very much like Canary Wharf, that weren't very much like the revival of the center of Halifax, or Huddersfield, or Smithfield. And it's quite interesting to note that of all the major cities in this country, that's over 180,000 persons, every single one has depopulated in the last 10 years, with the exception of Plymouth, It was in, uh, just off Times Square, with a Yorkshireman who'd become a theatrical agent, whose family still has a mill outside Bradford, named like Whitworth or someone, and Joe Littlewood and myself had a little um, drunken early morning brain-stretching session on what to call 
this brilliant thing we were designing in London. And uh, we went through layers of sort of verbal nausea, congratulating each other on being more and more banal, <laughs> until we arrived at fun, fun Palace. We just thought it was really tummy turning. A beauty to set before the planners, to set before the then GLC, whose land we required, to set before all the then serious, <coughs> worthy, narrow minded members of the AA, and the rest. And it was picked as, as really the worst taste we could think of. And yet now, fun, fun, I don't know if call fun palaces, but fun is now something that architects specialize in. <laughs> they design them in desperate towns, invariably where there have been steelworks, a swamp, or a plague. They do flumes dreadful, jointed, multicolored plastic things that tear the skin of sensitive siblings. They shot down with water to look stupid at the other end of an artificial beach which has a great rubber wave machine. Plants and the parents sit back and it's wonderful, the bar's license all day long here. The children will come to no harm. They do occasionally, but only by chance. <laughs> there was that funny one in that, that place near London Airport in, a, in one of those clay pits, which are about a quarter of a mile deep, if people did not know, did not know um, where some children bounced down a simulated Amazon or something in a rubber boat, and, and one kid had his ear torn off by another rubber boat going past at speed. But generally speaking, there isn't much, not much danger or delight. I only hope you can hear me over there. You can at the back, that's good. <laughs> One little bit. Um, <laughs> so, the, these, so these things are, are springing up, I would suggest, with very little to do with fun, almost as an alternative, certainly as an alternative to pleasure, but as an alternative to fun, unless fun is seen as a voluntarily agreed marketable commodity that the punters are prepared to pay for because they are called the parents. There, there is a, uh, it used to be a very good timber forest uh, and supplied lots of wood, not for ships, but for coal and pit props and things like that, and charcoal burners as well for gunpowder called Sherwood Forest. I was honored to be invited to the nature trail, Sherwood Forest, where a Dutch firm had built a great dome in the middle of the forest, um, where you can learn about trees in this dome, whether it's raining or not, because it's, it's summer all the day long. And, uh, and also, there are, there are walkways through the forest so you don't stray and possibly stand on a grass snake or a toad or turn your ankle on a molehill. Uh, there are people, they're probably all in the papers today, trying to stop fireworks because someone's hands blown off, blinded by a firework. That's no fun. Stop them. Uh, you try and get someone to sharpen a pencil now. They say, what do I use? And they get out an exacto that would take their leg off because no one has a pen knife around. Pen knives are out. Catapults you can't buy. Dangerous those, you could hit a pensioner between the eyes. <laughs> no, no, fun, fun really has got to be pretty safe. Like that advert for the first plastic toothpaste tube, they said, no chance of the tube emptying the wrong end. Because <laughs> they used to have lead ones, a little metal clip over. No fun in the bathroom any longer. 
The, uh, it's very serious, though, because the architectural profession supports all this. Pontings bought from, uh, it was probably either a leper colony or an army syphilis curative camp down on the Blackpool beach some years ago, a bit of sand with this camp there, which they turned into a holiday camp. It was a desperate holiday camp, but you were by what, though polluted, is a superb beach, Blackpool Beach, and a rather superb town, if you like choice of rock and fish <laughs> and chips. And it, it ran very happily for years, but the architects and the clients decided, no, no, it rains in Blackpool. We'll turn this into a fun dome. So they have built this enormous dome right on the beach with real sand, and it's 120 in the shade every day, 24 hours a day, every day of the year. Palm trees and things, you go in there and you sweat, you get out and you have to wait for a number 11 bus and the blinding Atlantic rain. <laughs> Only this year did they have bad returns because of the weather. Someone said, hey, it's not bad out here. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to pay. <laughs> because that's another thing that is absolutely associated with fun, is uh, that it's, it's got to be seen to run out before your money runs out. Whether it's fruit machines or anything. I mean, Meccano sets and plasticine no good at all. You can, you, you can straighten the bits out that you bent to get the nut on, or you can make another bit of modelling with the plasticine, although it's all gone grey by then, because you mixed it. No, no, Lego. Something. There's a magazine on sale tonight that... that uh, who's that uh, fellow? That's it, in Lego. Hooray, you've seen. Did you buy it? You've got it, you've got it. Well, it's better inside, yeah. Wonderful. Oh, I, I'm warming to the audience. You can help me out again. Um, now, this, this business of, of, of fun, uh, irrespective of, I think, of pleasure, has got something to do with, with reducing choice, um, but in a very subtle way, so that you feel you've got everything. Now, in, at the first Disneyland, admittedly, you could go in, and you didn't have to train for 20 years in the Royal Navy. You could go in your own submarine, under a monorail, past the Matterhorn Mark II. It wasn't the first Matterhorn. It was a bit smaller, but it's the same shape, and anyhow, you can't go in a submarine under a monorail by the Matterhorn where Mark I exists. So that had, and it wasn't much of a place to get to, Disneyland wasn't. But now they're building one north of Paris. Uh, I, I dare say the Scunthorpe thing or the Corby thing will be taken over. There's a clown who runs quite a good fun fair in a desperate area of North Staffordshire, Cannock, where up till then all there was was uh, derelict coal mines and shallow graves full of children. Now, uh, Alton Towers um, is not a bad fun fair, but there's not much around there. It's quite an expedition to get there. But the same man wants to have beef eaters, not the real ones, but the same size. And uh, the crown jewels, not the real ones, but just a sparkly. And uh, a, a coach and horses and the Tudor village in Battersea Power Station, which is about 10 minutes walk from Buckingham Palace where you can see a real queen, uh, real horses, things for free. So that the isolation requires um, a suspension of belief that you have any choice, that you only have choice once you enter the world of fun. And architects support this. They don't actually introduce pleasure and delight into what they're designing unless they're they're designing a fun building. They don't make bridges that you don't have to cross unless you want to wobble when you're in the mid-span and you think, thank goodness there's a bridge here, and get to the <laughs> other side. 
and then you watch someone else being just as frightened behind you. That might damage their psyche. And every time architects avoid introducing pleasure, choice, the unknown, the, the slightly doubtful, into their own architecture, whatever it is, abattoir, social services bureau, desk that wobbles, anything like that. Every time they avoid even testing, even pushing that, they are encouraging the sort of clients that encourage other architects to actually take all the pleasure out of fun. I mean, even, even the, I mean, they should at least be introducing miniature Mickey Mouses that come up and shake your hand. They're all bigger. Everywhere you go, Paris, Florida, Los Angeles, always Mickey's ten times as big as you. <laughs> Surely the ingenuity of man would be a horde of awful little Mickey Mouses. Something, get up there. Scale. Now, it's not going to be thought up by the people putting up the money. It's going to be thought up by you, the architects. And the whole business of, of distortion, that's the reason why uh, acid house parties are so damn good. Even the ones that don't happen are exciting. <laughs> because you block the motorway, you have the force scratching their head saying, you can't stop here, and there are 25,000 of you. <laughs> stop. I mean, the, 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 the one that did take place outside uh, Ongar or where it was, uh, they went in to arrest the people, and they found there were 76,000 people there. They never arrested 76,000. <laughs> I mean, I know it's overtime, but... And they went. You know, do you want a notebook? And... Uh, and, and, and computer hackers, marvellous. You probably bought the magazine as well, I did. There's a semi, semi illegal but well circulated Hackers Weekly now, <laughs> giving, giving marvellous. But it used to be how to make a, you know, a, a, it doesn't matter what it used to be, but I did used to make my own fireworks, and they were dangerous, but mainly to me. Now, that sort of provision for pleasure and fun. That's not in, in any Ministry of Culture's book as to, as to uh, facilities for the new town. Have you ever seen that? I wish someone would find that plastic balloons full of helium really are probably the most dangerous thing to let loose because they're doing it every weekend in Milton Keynes. <laughs> Save a Vietnam children, let a million helium balloons go and off they go, or that's something else. And that's fun. The trouble is that the design of pleasure isn't much pleasure for the designer. It's bloody hard work, but it's got to be pleasure of the user, and it has got to be in such a way that the user is constantly surprised that a thing is pleasurable. Once he knows, oh, it's fun, he'll be asked to pay for it. And that won't be fun for the designer either, but that is what is happening every time. It's almost written down. We laughed at those headings, the national plan, milk early, drink later, or whatever it was, and all that. Just the same mentality of... Uh, it, it's quite interesting that the National Trust, for once, I thought were going to get it right last Saturday, where, in fact, they are objecting to the privatization of water resources because of the leftover land. Now, water resources invariably had more land uh, in a valley than they'd actually flooded because you, you had to stop people from slipping into it. I mean, there was a, sort of the penumbra again, which you put fences around, but people could fish and things like that. And a great deal of land owned by water authorities. Now it is likely that the new privatized water authorities will sell off that land for sunshine homes in North Lancashire, you know, 
take the boat out in, <laughs> in a Cumbrian sun blaze, etc., etc. And for one minute, the National Trust sort of said, we're going to oppose this. We, we want this, this not designated land, just left, not designated. It was always free. The odd person who peed in a, in a multi-million gallon reservoir wasn't going to affect the furring up of anyone's kettle in <laughs> Mithamroyd. Mid like. But they blew it. Right at the end, someone up gave an amendment and said, I think we should start a fund in order to buy the land and put it under National Trust ownership. Which is a fine dividing line. Because once you actually designate an area, then you get the others coming in. Not necessarily, they won't, it won't be people building fun palaces, but it's people saying, how about a butterfly park for the blind? <laughs> or so, you know, how, how, how about an easy walkway for double amputee headless ex servicemen? <laughs> Uh, you know, can't we put signs up in 17 languages saying 100 meters for the best view? <laughs> or, or a sign telling about the fantastic engineering that went into the dam, and another sign doing a section of it. And then, then a little shop where you could buy bits of the rock uh, that was used in construction that was left over. <laughs> and a guidebook on where those rocks came from, indeed drawings of people hewing them in the 18th century, <laughs> and, and, in the, and then you can get them by post. In fact, you don't need to go there. If you're a member of the National Trust, you can buy these bloody guidebooks and stay at home. And then you need a bookshelf in that room marked library in your house, which you were hoping might be an anonymous bit of space. And all the time, the build-up, of the so-called fun industry is anti-pleasure, is anti-delight, is anti-risk, is anti-growing up, it's anti that last element which architectures should introduce into whatever they're designing, which is wonder. Wonder and delight. And that's only related to mystery and may only be occasioned once. And, and that is enough. Someone might say, ah, I've seen Durham Cathedral. <laughs> yeah, it was good the first time. That's all right. That's all right. Now, the, the uh, proposition, therefore, that I'm making is, th is that one tries, in fact, not to imagine the end product as a, as a designer in relation to planning for pleasure, but tries very hard to see whether, in whatever one is doing, one can introduce a, uh, a sort of a mental frontiersman element for a split second in the user. The, the, the sheet of stamps that the third stamp in a row mm -hmm. tastes of lemon when you lick it. <laughs> This, I promise, is, is my last reference to Peter, but that particular record was chosen because I do feel it is the most boring bit of music I've ever heard. Valero. We could play it, and I needn't speak. We could play it on and on. But I also think that, that computers, in their present sense, are, are pretty boring as well. And unfortunately, the reason for this is that they don't get tired um, and that they're never bored because they don't, well, it, that's not quite true. Up till now, they're never bored because 
no one's ever thought, probably if they never thought of those ponies uh, down in the pits, um, they probably never thought, well, we know they'll get blind if we keep them down long enough and won't eat quite so much as they do when they've got eyesight, because you know when you're blind, even with ponies, their appetite goes a bit. Um, it's, it's true. And uh, they probably thought that similar about computers, that it's probably better not to let them know that they could get bored. Uh, so we won't program them for that. Uh, they, they're real little beavers, they'll go on. Yeah? I mean, we, we don't have to use words like approximate, or we think it's more than, or it's likely that there are many, or, um, well, the proportion, I would say, is roughly. And all those phrases, oh, no, little old Jimmy Cricket, he'll operate away and come up with it, with um, a language that in itself is boring, not because the computers are, are boring, but because we have that absurd conceit as human beings as opposed to machines. So we want to be in at regular intervals just checking that everything's going all right. Now that used to be confined very largely to teachers in secondary schools where even in uh, advanced mathematics they would want you to write down all the bloody simultaneous equations that you've done in order to find the answer. And I can remember that you could get the answer absolutely wrong and still get 8 out of 10 because actually you put the right equations halfway through. Uh, now, this business, I think it's probably an Anglo-Saxon disease, this business of rewarding industry despite its staggering inaccuracy and indeed <laughs> wrong-headedness <laughs> is something that, that is, is bred in the educational system, which, of course, to, with the exception of, of um, Braithwaite, it wasn't Braithwaite. Who, who what was his name? What? The, 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 uh, the computer man, the first one. Yeah, Babbage. What's well, like Braithwaite? I think related to Braithwaite. Okay. Um, Braithwaite, uh, Babbage, was actually, uh, he had a very interesting education. However, with his exception, primarily, those who, who've uh, devised uh, computer languages over the years have been of the of the failed secondary schoolmaster mentality, um, and uh, also it's awfully good when they were when computers were very big. I think the biggest in the country is still in the science museum, which was the Leo Leo One Joe Lyons one, which they gave to the science museum, made by English Electric and, and all sorts of tinkers, I imagine. Um, it was enormous things, and, and, and dust, the half micron of dust could last the thing up for weeks. And um, all boxes, things had to be changed. It was a terrific process. It was like they, um, it was like those machines, those steam engines, which I'm sure many of you are buying this Christmas, pretending they're for someone younger than yourself. These Mahmood steam engines, where it says, uh, you know, you, you actually boil steam and, and the pistons go and the steam engine goes across, rolling over miniature Mickey Mouse is on the way. <laughs> and, and, and it says, uh, oil the joints. There's no need to oil the joints at all. It's rather Mary Baker's cake mix. Mary Baker's cake mix. Brilliant idea. It used to be advertised in the Saturday Evening Post. That dates me. Um, and it always, uh, you had this cake mix and then it says, add an egg. So actually, it was back to home cooking. Just like, like, you know, got a bit of shell in, I have to start again, throw that out. <laughs> it had got plenty of egg powder in it, didn't need an egg at all, but that was the, with all powdered cake, add an egg. Now that, that was the attitude to computers, and in effect still is, in a lot of instances. Uh, not necessarily it will come on to the architectural use of computers, which I think may be a contradiction in terms, but, um, but the general use of computers is primarily that <coughs> those analysts and uh, programmers, they want to know what it's up to, <laughs> you see, and, and the program sort of runs so that you can check and, and double check and you get another machine to do that checking or you actually do a store and you know that's checking and you sh she, she that it is checking and all that. <laughs> and that's surely some mistake. 
And uh, so what, what happens, really, is that, is that um, an absolutely a blind pit donkey, which is what a computer is, is constantly being woken up and, uh, you know, to prove its salt. Um, now, what happens then is that uh, people start thinking up things for computers to do. There, 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 there are a great number of things that, that, that sh computers should be doing, which are still being done by, by gallop poles. <laughs> and, uh, very, you know, and, and Ernie, well, he's a bit of a computer, but uh, there's a whole range of, of things which computers could do quite well, which would ease us a lot. And we could have dummy engine drivers and things like that. But so the nature of the computer is such that I think it is, it, it's, a, it's, a, it, it, it's a rare thing because it hasn't been going for millions of years. But in a way, it's an endangered species. It's under threat by the very people who designed it. That is, it, it, it's at least if not endangered, it's, its development is being retarded by us. Just like the development of the keyboard, of the typewriter, and the transference of such keyboards to, to uh, early computers. The whole nature of the transference, I mean, whether one goes back to, you know, horses are always at the front of the coach, therefore you have an engine at the front of the car, etc., etc., can be applied to a whole nature of, of processes related to, to computers and their, that awful word, the interface, where in fact people have to operate them. In many instances, they, they don't have to. Now, in relation to architecture, when we have in the audience exponents of the most advanced intelligent use of computers in relation to architectural design, not just drawing out the thing as already designed, in order to turn it through 45 degrees and show your client what a sparrow about to alight on the top of it would see. <laughs> or, you know, a worm coming up in the main atrium. Just look. This is how it, you know, you had eye level to it and all that. But even so, even so, the necessity to, uh, to actually check on something halfway through, I think is, has got a touch of the architectural Mary Baker's cake mix add an egg attitude to things. And it makes us a little feeble as, as artificers of the unknown, which is what we are. Um, fortunately, if you take the, uh, that huge linear accelerator, the CERN thing, the two and a half kilometer <coughs> diameter or five kilometer diameter accelerator. Uh, you can't actually stop that halfway through. Once you've set that up, you, you've got to wait until the two things eventually hit and then are separated and then analyzed. And you can't say, hold it, I think we've got a hit, sir, let's have it. No way. You, know, if, if you start it and a year later you might, you might find that you've got something. Um, this, this, I think, could be an advantage if computers weren't mucked around with so much. Even in, um, I mean, I'm not even talking about uh, the, the, the sort of uh, candlestick application that architects, the sort of attitude that the RIBA and all those overpriced courses that they run, um, use of computers in architects' offices, which, all that. Uh, not that, but even, even at the level of, uh, because of that lovely element of never getting bored, of exploring the hitherto uh, inexplorable, for actually investigating the hitherto considered impossible. Because impossible usually had something to do with time. That was the other record I wanted. Was it uh, 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 difficult to take some time, impossible a little bit longer? That the, the computer can do that. So it can actually bend our definition of unthinkable. And in doing so, I suggest it will come up with the inconsidered, 
the unconsidered, not the inconsidered, the unconsidered, because it was thought impossible. And that, that it may be that, as is being done in many cases, not only at NASA, which is quite an impressive program, where computers uh, not only talk with computers, but try and trick each other out. They're having all sorts of games, which we would find awfully painful and really unfair to play with machines. And they are, are doing this so that there is, uh, because there is no loss element. There is no, uh, they haven't lost anything. They haven't lost their energy. They haven't uh, thought, oh, blimey, I'm worn out after that. And, was, and, that, and computer number three was only tricking me after all, <laughs> you know. Uh, but you see, even then, even then, uh, the architects and designers uh, come in because there is this, this program at NASA where, um, and this will be going some years, where if you don't ask, uh, it's programmed in such a way, if you don't ask particular questions of, of a storage bank, uh, uh, I think it's online storage bank, online, offline, across the line, but if you don't ask questions, a particular range of questions often enough, then it becomes microseconds slower in, in bringing out the answer. It's still got the answer, but the retrieval is, is a bit slower. And Ben, you probably know the name, but eventually, I think they call it, eventually it, it drips out of the bottom of the machine. And it's lost. Leaks. It, that's right. It's the leak. It leaks out. You see it. Right. That's right. That's it. Exactly. The machine. And, and that is the first indication that I had that perhaps you could you could produce computers that got bored because they weren't asked the right questions often enough. No one asked them. Yeah. I, I'm not going to wait for you any longer, Ben. You come next week. I'm taking the show. Now, in, in relation to that, there are... Um, situations where, in fact, coming back to that business of uh, me not being quite convinced that we are using something, as we thought, as simple as a house, which I think is the most complex of, of machines, um, that the computer might finally come back with a whole range of natures of spaces and of objects having us put in quite an ordinary program that uh, appeared to be nothing more than every third floor in that god-awful Caesar Pelly pyramidal topped tower in <laughs> Canary Wharf was, was a home for old people. Every third floor. Now, this actually occasioned young stalwart men walking through this home for old ladies uh, checking the, the fiber optics of the floor below and above every now and again, which was excitement because they never had visitors because they were too old. And the computer had thought of that. So, so mixes, actual operational mixes came together that resulted in conglomerates of form, of architectural form, that we would never bother thinking of because of too many ifs and buts and et cetera, et cetera. And uh, we wouldn't, for instance, in such a program, as I've just suggested, ever thought of, of detailing in the real truth stories, the truth after the office is shut and he's gone home uh, to look at his bank balance of the estate agent who knows he can't let those floors for another three years in Canary Wharf, but don't tell anyone because his life's at stake. And, the, and all of a sudden, old person's home for cheery people who will live longer and be less of a demand on the health service because they won't be go gaga because these men mending the fiber optics. Now, this may sound a bit run of the mill. Um, I can't be as fanciful in the limited time I have as one might be. But again, it is only going to be architects who introduce elements such as a computer can make a meal of without having to report back halfway through. And that indeed the reporting back can again be a random selection by the architect saying, well, I'm tired of them playing together. Let's see what it's at at this stage. 
and you won't actually be, you know, breaking the embryo or whatever. You won't, you won't, you won't have damaged anything. You can check, uh, but you check not with a result required in mind, not with, let's see if he's done the simultaneous equations, but, blimey, it's a year and a week since that Thursday. Let's have a look. Nothing more than that. And that can be put in a relation to programming that can uh, be keyed, for instance, in, re in relation to architecture, to frequency of use of, of things like light switches, lavatories, doors, uh, emptying letter boxes, or whatever. Some sort of interval that is known to have an outside uh, generative key, like milk is delivered every day, or letters are delivered twice a day, or this street is usually quieter on Sunday. So you actually can introduce things which primarily in architecture nowadays are introduced as adverse effects. Can we have a letterbox that the dog inside won't bite the postman's finger off but he can get big envelopes through? Can we have uh, you know, a, a front door or a wall on this lovely neighborhood street that is large enough, uh, heavy enough not to let the sound of the new 42 ton Euro trucks, deafness as they go by. And that's always done as defense afterwards. They then say, well, you can live in the center of London and you're paying a bit extra because we have these heavy walls on and you won't be disturbed by Euro trucks. All those sort of equations can actually be fed in earlier on because the other thing is that the computer doesn't, uh, unless you program it such, and this is the other danger of, um, in a way, programmers, putting in too many um, of their own uh, relative priorities. That, that, uh, the two, that, that qualitative judgments are made not only too early on, in some cases they shouldn't be made at all, but it should be purely a, a, a quantitative assessment and then a probability so that in fact, uh, after a time, the use by architects of computers move from probability to possibility, to it is possible. Not it's probable your client will like this. This is possible. Then, in fact, you can use the computer as, 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 as the best partner you've got and not <coughs> as, as that tired, blind donkey down the pit. <coughs> timing's going off. <laughs> ah, well, it's a, it's a feeble one, but it's, there are two things that interest me, and they come into my last point, that uh, if you take the largest integrated computer network in the world after that of the Pentagon integrated network, is that of British Rail, believe it or not. And the information that could be accessed through their network, already laid throughout this country, is, is, is enormous. And yet, one of the main things is the running of digital clocks on platforms. <laughs> and do you know why they like digital clocks? Because they no longer give railway drivers free watches. And British Rail railway drivers like saying, oh, the 8.15 is 15 seconds late. They insist on those second bits on the digital clocks, whereas the users of railways want optical clocks where, like me, you know that a big slice of cake, 20 minutes, means you can have a cup of tea or go to the lavatory before you catch the train. <laughs> If you think of that clock, and that, 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 that slice of time, it is an indication 
of the uh, transference, which is key to all good architecture, of the fourth dimension of time to the whole process of, 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 uh, of what we produce and why we produce it and what the product is. And risk of boring everyone but me, the, the, the life of building is uh, use, reuse, misuse, disuse, and refuse. And that architects should be taught about demolition. Bucky Fuller, who uh, last year reached the, the, there was the 50,000th application for his patent for construction of a geodesic dome. And 10 years ago, he predicted that by now it would, there would have been 1 million, and it was 50,000. Now, that's not too bad. That's not too bad an assessment. You see how the cost of the Channel Tunnel goes up, and that's far less difficult a prediction to make. However, the uh, nature of the, the seeing the fourth dimension, seeing that slice of cake on a clock, which you associate with having a pee, making a phone call, buying another magazine, which you don't necessarily subtract uh, 1817 from, from 1901 immediately and think, ah, oh, that's, that's a cup of tea, <laughs> if ever there was. Um, th this business, of course, is, is uh, worked on and has been for years by, by uh, the, the American and over here, um, Richard Gregory and his exploratory, where, in fact, uh, <laughs> he goes on saying, oh, well, it's a you know, laboratory of learning for children, but he knows damn well that it, it's full of adults all the time. I mean, they're the ones who are really thrilled because the, uh, the experiment, for instance, where he has two um, ball bearings on a rope and uh, they're some distance apart and you blow a hairdryer or a vacuum cleaner, anything that blows uh, between them and you think they'll go apart and in fact they come together, you see. Well, kids say, so what? I was wrong, you know, where's the next toy? <laughs> and uh, whereas adults say, hey, that's, oh, that's something. <laughs> and uh, he has this gas jet that you can play music to and you can actually measure the wavelength, the jet. You can tip, a, a hit a, a, what do they call it, tuning fork. There it goes. Now, all that business about um, uh, seeing ain't necessarily believing is related also to um, an awareness of, of what you're seeing and what you're prepared to believe. But that is in that third section tonight. That is in fun, delight, wonder. Not in our responsibility. We've got to know as much as we can. And you start off as, uh, with knowing the weight of everything you design. Whether you're going to pick it up or require some bricklayer on a wet Thursday morning to pick it up and throw it to his mate or butter one side, or in a high-tech building to, to get that well-oiled nut going up into that wonderful detail you drew where center lines were right the way through, and uh, <laughs> someone had dropped the RSJ off the crane that morning and slightly put it out, and you had had a rough night, and the rain was running down your purpose-designed rubber glove which you haven't replaced and etc etc and you know the weight of that nut after a few minutes and you think to hell with it, it and, and bang it up so it isn't just the business of of knowing the weight of everything that may be handled it's knowing the weight of what you finish up with it isn't just the poem about you know Vanbrugh's death uh, it was this Swift wrote this thing lay heavy on him earth, because he has made, laid many heavy loads on thee. That was on the, the, the gravestone. Um, <clears throat> it's, 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 it's knowing, and again, it isn't just resources and rainforests and all that. It isn't that. It's just another element of what you are designing, which you can appreciate as, as far as, as touch and weight goes. 
Now, there is another element of touch which I think is important in the hold on to it, and that is just knowing um, why, in fact, uh, cold aluminium burns the toes off, off birds in the winter because it's so cold. Or, or what are they call toes? They've got toes. <laughs> knowing, knowing, knowing the effects of, of things that you design for, like temperature change, expansion joints, movement, on other reasons, knowing the effects of the causation of having things like expansion joints, actually knowing what heat does, knowing what weight is, knowing what is wet, knowing how heavy a thing is, knowing which is nicer to, nicer to feel as a handrail, as a doorknob, changing the weights of doors. So that door, not, oh Christ, this door is heavier than the rest, but this is the heavy door. Or, uh, as opposed to just saying doors, they're all the same, right? They're doors a door a door, put them all in. Delaying people, introducing delay, introducing interval. If you introduce delay, you introduce acceleration. You, you, you introduce into what you've designed a capacity to play with it. It's not just shaving the edge off the, you know, the joker and the pack. The other thing is, this whole business of hold, hold on to it uh, and in relation to demolition, is that there is an increasing need for um, sort of things to come down, not always buildings, but very often buildings, because they're in the wrong place or they need it anymore. And to feel that, that the, over the centuries that, that uh, people have known how to chop a tree down and get it, get it land exactly where they want it so they can tear it out easily without, without lousing up any other trees, etc., etc. And yet to feel that it's still a mystique to, to drop a building carefully is, is absurd because we are the people who put the buildings up in the first place. So I think that demolition and weight is... is um, something to do with, with uh, a tactile expertise that we don't need to tell others about, but we should be aware of ourselves. That's why Bucky put the weights on his drawing. Nine times out of ten, 99 times out of 100, it didn't really matter. But there was the weight of every element, whatever he drew. Um, it's interesting that increasingly, again, not in our profession, but, but in, in the general sort of heavy end of the artifactual manufacturing industries of this world, that the latest uh, floating crane, Dutch crane, um, with only eight, it, it can level itself with 18 inches of clear water, and it draws about 11 feet, so 12 foot six or whatever that is in meters, not a very deep pool scarcely drown a horse in it. 12 foot 6 of water, that crane would lift up Jim Sterling's Cambridge Library with all the books in, had it been designed to be lifted up. So the whole business about holding and moving and lifting, just like, on the other hand, the reversal of that is, of course, that, that is a rather a static situation, except in the actual moving. The whole... The whole um, business of the uh, railway train, which uh, Gibson, when he was designing the original class buildings, which were anti-substance uh, two-story, Donald Gibson, two-story, seven-patch building, steel frame. That was the point, the generator of the CLASP system, and probably the best and only valid use of it, come to think of it. Um, he, he had done various, uh, he always used to refer to them, whether he'd done them or not, there's calculations on the fact that you could support uh, something that weighed 200 tons moving 100 miles an hour on uh, a couple of planks and a pile of, of granite chippings. And of course, that was a locomotive. You spread the, the load accordingly, and, and you could even move it at, at terrific speed. Which brings me, apropos, back to fun, that you will all be pleased to know that yesterday, a blind motorist 
drove, broke the world record of driving a sports car at 120 miles an hour over some sands in North Wales. Now, how daft can you get? However, it, it, it has hit the papers, and it was probably blind sports car racing, Alvin. How about that? That's something we never thought of. How do you design a track for them? Doesn't matter what the view of the sunset's like, I can tell you. Right, so the other business about uh, mobility is, is the whole element of, um, which is a minor element, but it's something worth thinking about, is calculated wobble. Now, <coughs> the films <coughs> of, the, of the earthquake were very interesting because uh, I, I watched them really uh, not thinking, oh, I hope it'll go, or it's amazing it hasn't fallen over. It, it, it actually hinted that there may be some things that would be, uh, at times in their life, rather good if they did wobble, not just fruit trees. There may be. I don't know what they are. But it, it proved the point that you can actually design for, for wobble. Whereas, you know, usually, this is the trouble with architecture, it usually assumes that there's always a delicate vase of flowers on a well-tuned piano on the 17th floor of a block of flats. And therefore, primarily what you're designing is, is you're trying to forget wind. That's what all most structural design is about, is wind loading, is stiffness. It's not strength. It's not strength of the material. It's not loading. It's, it's stiffness. Um, this, obviously, I was brought in touch with when someone pointed out to me, obviously an ornithologist, that uh, birds in a cage didn't mind too much if that cage moved a bit. They, they never noticed that they were flying around anyhow. Um, the, uh, the, the other um, quality is the, back to the Mickey Mouse thing, is, is the whole business of the opportunity for uh, a, a conscious miniaturization of size. Um, it's quite interesting that a number of bits of equipment, uh, motor car equipment, largely at the cheap end of the market, funny little watches, clever little shavers, things like that. The end product is, is wonderful because it is smaller than the other one had been. So you put a shaver in, in, your, in your fob pocket, in your watch pocket, or something like that. Those are marvelous. But then you find that they miniaturize the screws as well. <laughs> and they, they miniaturize the little plastic clips that tag things on, so they break off. So there's, there's, there's a mind comes into it, rather like the, I, I, have a, I have a bean with a little knob on top, tiny little bean, you open it, and there's the smallest carved ivory elephant in the world inside this bean. But they probably made millions of them. But it, it, this nature of miniaturization is, is a, something which we have to use uh, selectively. And we don't. We tend, whether we're talking about housing estate, whether we're talking about big units, and things, we tend to pick a scale that we then assume is appropriate for all the constituent parts. So what I'm suggesting is that, is that there's a lot of difference, or suggesting, I'm telling you, there's a lot of difference <laughs> between scale and size. And, and it is nothing naughty to, to, to distort scale and thereby alter and, and, and give variety to sizes rather than appropriate, the appropriate size. Um, again, one could go back to some of the, back to Parker Morris, some of the hilarious now drawings of the National Building Agency on generic house plans, whatever they meant. But, but also, they, they had these wonderful hallways where there were very large sort of, sort of rally bicycles drawn on top, and, and very large bits of equipment. Um, uh, skis were drawn, big wooden skis in, in cupboards, and television sets had an enormous sort of thing like a, a wind tunnel out, sticking out of the back of them. So you always put them in the corner of the room, because otherwise furniture embarrasses corners. You know those awful little kitchen cupboards that, 
no one ever knows what you put in except saucepans that you're given and are not planning to use. Um, the other thing is the uh, adaptation of friendly bulk. Um, there is a, there's an assumed economy in, in um, doing something with the space between two barriers though probably the space in itself would be fine. It's very interesting seeing that the uh, <coughs> advent of the, the, the people who are even worse than those who sell encyclopedias to old ladies saying, do you want to buy your grandson the knowledge of a lifetime? And phrases like that. Uh, are those people who sell uh, patent glazing? And um, the, 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 the most popular one at the moment is in fact the thinnest, narrowest one available. Whereas it would be a damn sight better if it was very wide and contained a lot more air appropriate to, to the wavelength of the sound it's meant to be keeping out. Um, because they, all they do is, is a, a thermal barrier. If they're a bit coarser and wider and, and some, something like matched the openings that they're likely to go into, they'd be a damn sight useful and they could advertise them under two head headings. The, uh, the point of all these elements is that, and why, at oh, the end of the quotation, by the way, by Lawrence, is the autumn always gets me badly because all those colors start flowing in. And uh, the point of these talks, really, is that they have, I think, touch on marginal colors that make uh, the ordinary, the commonplace in architecture, of which we have far too much, capable of uh, an element hitherto thought impossible in, in the appropriate design form. That is, unless you can introduce, in fact, I think basically, um, unless there is an introduction, not you introduce as an additive, but there is an introduction of something hitherto thought inappropriate for architecture into your architecture, then you might as well just go on copying. Uh, because cribbing is pretty painless and computers will help you. But they need, if you test them, if you test them and test themselves, then in fact, it's likely that, that uh, architecture, as it once was, as it once was in the time of the uh, health rules, was seen as a major course for reducing physical illness amongst the poor. There's been very little movement by the architects of today seeing how, in fact, architecture can reduce me mental illness amongst all of us. In fact, in many instances, it would appear to reintroduce it. <laughs> Timing's gone wrong. <laughs> Let me see if I have anything else. Well, I haven't except that uh, architecture should not in any way suggest a useful reuse of old false teeth, or indeed find a socially enriching form of converting lunatic asylums. We're not in that business. Leave that for those who feel that mentally this society is more poverty stricken than it is. I want that music. <laughs>